Welcome. I hope you enjoy the conversation you're about to see between me and another comedian about religion and comedy. These are conversations I'm calling Disorganized Religion. God bless. And for those atheists out there, may nothing await you after this life. Welcome, nerds, to another edition of Disorganized Religion. I am your host, as always, Seth Lawrence. Today I am joined by the actor, writer, producer, voice actor, a gentleman of all trades, a real renaissance man, and podcaster for the last 13, 14 years. Something like that. David C. Smalley. Thank you. Notice he didn't say comedian. That's okay. <laughs> I should have started with comedian. I yeah, thought I right. did. That's all right. He's also a comedian. Fantastic comedian. Had a show at the Comedy Store monthly before the world decided to end. Hopefully that comes back. It's looking like it's going to, but yeah. they're, they're coming back in phases. And, of course, people with their names on the building go first. And so I'm waiting my turn. <laughs> Patiently hoping my show comes back soon. So yeah, we'll, well, I hope it does, and it'll come back with a vengeance when it does. Oh man, people are so many people are excited. Not only the comics are excited to get back on stage, but right. people just want to be around other humans. I don't think we realized like how much we really needed each other. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's really bizarre doing stuff like that from home, and we just crave being around one another. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Did you do any Zoom shows? I refused. <laughs> Is that right? I refused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what our, was your th- our mutual reasoning? friend Rogelio did a bunch of them. Right. I just fe- this is going to sound weird, and this is my own personal theory. And with comedy, as you know, everybody's got to find something that works for themselves. Yeah. Um, I think. Uh, God, I don't want to come off sounding like an ass. <laughs> I just, I just, I, I feel like it would make me worse. Uh-huh. In a weird performing on Zoom, performing for no one, or performing <laughs> yeah. for digital faces. Yeah, it just—I don't know. I, it it never felt right to me. Like I, I could stand in my living room and do it to uh, an empty couch. Sure. And if I did that over and over, I would begin performing that way. I'm I'm a big proponent of practice, like you play. And uh-huh. So I want to. I'm to the point now where I have my stuff that I know works. I'm really past the point of just absolute bombing. Like I've done that several times. <laughs> sure. I'm past that point. So now what I like to do is take my set that I know works, and if I want to try new stuff, I pepper it in between the stuff I know works. That way, if yeah. I have a joke that goes badly, the whole set isn't ruined because of it. So right, that, that's my right. that's my, that's my my mode now. I just I was afraid to get on a Zoom and do something that was just terrible. Plus, as you know, it's all comedians on the Zoom shows. A lot of them, yeah. It, it's so packed with comedians, and comics are the worst to perform <laughs> for. So you, you can't, like, I can tell you how many times I've, I've done jokes at open mics, Taken them out because no one laughed, yeah. and then accidentally peppered them back into a set of an actual show, and they do great. And I'm like, comics are terrible. Yeah, they're terrible audience members. Yeah, no, it's true, and it depends on the Zoom show. I found I did a I did a fair share. A lot of them would do like audience muted, other than comics because they didn't want to deal with hecklers. Oh, so or background so noise. So you couldn't hear any laughter either. So you couldn't hear any laughter unless the other comics were laughing. The, the toughest ones were those, or ones where it was like two separate rooms, where it was a Zoom meeting where you were performing, but then they were streaming to Twitch or, you know, oh, to some yeah. other platform <laughs> to uh, to get it out to the audience, as opposed to just having everybody in the Zoom meeting. I see. So those were the two toughest, and it's because you don't get that feedback. So, right. So when the audience was there and they could laugh and you get the feedback. Yeah, those were not bad. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not like... It was a like, weird delay, I'm sure, right? Yes, right, exactly. Yeah, and then someone would just be randomly holding a cat. Right. someone's kid yeah, yeah, would yeah. yell, Mom! Like, yep, and have to <laughs> time out for bedtime or whatever. <laughs> yeah. There People was just one. get up and walk away from the camera and then come back. Yeah, there was one I did where a kid took the mom's phone. Like, it was just in the kitchen, oh, you know, so and she was just, like, finishing up dinner or something, and the kid wandered in, took the phone... And uh, I was up. I usually go fairly clean, but it was fun. So you weren't clean then. I just f bombs all over the place. No, I was (laughs) still I was still clean. I was still clean, but it's always fun to make parents scared. Do you you do f bombs on the show? No. You allow your guests to? Oh, I don't. I don't care. Oh, you be you. I usually don't curse on my show on my own show. Yeah. No. What I do is I release two versions. One that's like edited for heavy cursing, and another that's just just raw, unedited. Now I feel bad being an editor. I know, like I should just give you one version. But part of me <laughs> wants to intentionally make your life hard. Oh man! Force you to do two versions. So that I has get... nothing to do with you being an editor. That's you being a comic. <laughs> You're right. You know? <laughs> the comic in me wants to make life hard for you, but the editor right. in me feels remorse. Right. 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 Yeah, right. I get it. Right. No, I appreciate that. How long have you been doing stand-up? 
Oh man, I think I started in, so when I was about 21 years old, I did my first comedy show, absolutely bombed, and then didn't do it again for like 12 years. Where where did you do your first Dallas. show? Dallas. Dallas, yeah. Okay. Was it an open mic No, setting, no, just... it was actually, um, it had some pretty big name comics on it, uh-huh. and I, I bombed, it was awful. It was Man. so bad. Yeah. And I sat back down and was like, I need to reevaluate my entire life. <laughs> and I started focusing on podcasting and uh-huh. built, you know, my job doing that. Started doing that full time. Yeah. And then I was asked to go uh, in 2016 to the Reason Rally, which was like a big meeting of like skeptics and atheists and scientists. Oh, okay. And I, I went there and they were like, hey, you have a pretty popular podcast. Will you MC a comedy show for us? And I was like, yeah, I'll even write a short little set to do at the beginning and they were like great so I just on my own I was asked to host because of the podcast Uh decided to try to be funny and I've always given talks at these science and atheist conventions and I always made them funny so I always wrote jokes into this so to say I didn't do comedy for 12 years is not really true I mean I gave presentations that were funny with powerpoints and stuff Uh for like 8 years without being on the comedy circuit gotcha so in 2016 I actually went yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I went full on stand up in 2016. So, oh, okay. So, uh, and started booking shows. And then by 20, like mid 2018, I had my own show at the comedy store. Gotcha. And just stuck with that since. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Nice. So, what drew you to stand up? I mean, I've seen some of your sets where you talk about your dad mm-hmm. showing you the Richard Pryor tapes yeah. when you were super young. So, it had always been a dream? To always, stand-up man. I didn't even know people could do that for a living. Like, oh, I just really? thought it was, yeah, I've never. I used to do impressions of the Incredible Hulk when I was like five. Oh, okay. And my mom would bring her friends over and be like, David, do that thing. And yeah. I would I would do it, and then I would start improvising funny stuff that the Hulk would never do. Uh-huh. But I was doing the Hulk as a comedian as like four or five years old. It gotcha. was just something I always loved doing. I mean, it's, I don't know. It was just always something I, I, I was drawn to. And so I, I did a couple of plays, you know, in elementary school and just had a yeah. little touch of it. But Hollywood was for rich people. Like <laughs> sure. when I was a kid, right, right. it was like I, I wanted to. I kept telling my mom. I, I didn't know how to explain. I would tell my mom. I would say, I want to do something I love doing, and she would go, "You're supposed to hate your job. That's why God <laughs> made beer." That was my mom's. Oh. Comp- and so I was like, "Oh, you know." Wow. I thought, "What about college? As for rich people, shut up. Let's go to work." Yeah, and I was like. Box factory, concrete factory, yeah. you know, pet food factory. Yeah. And it was just that blue collar mentality. And I was, man, I was like 26. And I just went, no, how about no to all of this? Yeah. And I just shifted my entire focus. Even when I did stand up when I was like 21, that was play fun time. That was yeah. just something for fun, but you got to go to work. And it wasn't until, you know, about 2013, my podcast got sustainable enough that I didn't have to go to work anymore. Gotcha. And that's, that's, man, I feel like, I mean, I haven't had a full, I haven't had a job since 2013. Yeah. I've had my own and a decent income, been able to support me and my daughter, and I'm, I'm doing great. And that's I'm amazing. I'm so thankful for my listeners to make that happen. Yeah. that's So you've been doing the podcast, started as Dogma Debate, or did it start yeah, as something else? It started as Dogma Debate uh-huh. in like 2010, and then by 2013, because um, it started as a blog in 2008. Oh, okay. And I couldn't keep up with the comments. I, Chris, oh, is Christians that right? would come comment, sure. and I would reply, and then a nasty, ridiculous <laughs> atheist would come on and be like, you just believe in Santa Claus from grown-ups. And I'd go, hey, how about not be a jackass right. right here? And do you think the person's actually going to listen to you if you respond that way? Right. And they would almost always apologize and say, you're right, I should be more courteous. And I would try to help people have productive discussions. Yeah. And it got the blog got pretty popular, and I couldn't keep up with it. Gotcha. So I was sure. like, if I recorded my responses, this would go much faster. Yeah. And then I was finding myself also calling in to like fundamentalists. Uh huh. Internet radio is what we were oh, calling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, sure. And I would I would call into those like shows. Like Catholic talk radio. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Uh-huh. And I would record myself calling into their show uh-huh. and putting it out, and I'm like. I could just have them on my show. And so I started my own podcast in 2010 called Dogma Debate. And I just recently changed the name to just David C. Smalley. Right. At the advice of my publicist and agents and saying, just keep it you brand your yeah. name, not your, you know. Because yeah. there are lots of people who know Dogma Debate and don't know David C. Smalley. Right. So they were like, we need to marry the two for your acting career. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you've been doing acting for quite a while, too. Yeah, I have. Uh, I was with the Groundlings for a while. I went to their uh, school. I taught improv for a while. Uh-huh. I uh, was in a, a national ring commercial. 
Uh-huh. Where I went up for the lead, got a call back for the lead, and they were like, you have more of a burglar face. <laughs> <laughs> and made me the burglar. Nice. And so they then, put you in a beanie. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then, uh, and then, uh, and then they did this. They, um, they said so. After about two hours, three hours of me breaking into this house over and over. Yeah. The assistant director tells the director that I look too much like the guy who got the lead. Oh. And so the director calls me. There was this extra guy who was also a burglar. Uh huh. But he didn't have. He had live theater experience, but he'd never like been on screen. He didn't have any. Credentials. He didn't have like the, the ground lead. I, I was considered like the lead burglar. I was getting all the close ups and me breaking in, <laughs> looking around the house. Sure. And then about two hours into it, the director yells out, Hey, it looks like this guy's breaking into his own house. <laughs> oh, because you two. Because I look yeah, like the, the, the lead. And, yeah. And so they had me spend about 30 minutes with the guy in the back, the back burglar, uh-huh. training him on all these acting terms oh. and everything he was supposed to know. And then he got the lead burglar role. Oh, that's so, so cool. So you just see me running around behind him, even though I trained <laughs> this guy. And so I said to the director at one point, oh. I said, wait a minute. I said, so, so I look too much like the lead to be the lead burglar but right. not enough like the lead to be the lead right. he goes welcome to hollywood son <laughs> and you're too talented yeah. oh. to be the backup burglar sure. until so you we got to let you up. go <laughs> that is yeah. cold-blooded yeah. right there and that's, then oh i mean but the, the paycheck was the same and that's what they sure. think we care about but right. i wanted right. the screen time of course you know? the credit uh, yeah. notoriety yep. and yeah. then i booked uh, i booked a part on a nickelodeon uh sitcom called Danger Force. It was known as Henry Danger forever. Uh-huh. And uh, I got to be a criminal named Reggie on that show. Uh-huh. Noticing and, uh, a trend. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely, I'm already getting ty- typecast <laughs> after just a couple of roles. Right. I just have the face that looks like I want to take your stuff. Sure. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. 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 So I get take it. stuff and take faith. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah! There we go. Good crossover, man. Hey. I'll take your stuff and your faith. That should be the tagline of my podcast. There you go. There you go. No, I get it. It's the way I look. A lot of times when I walk on stage, my opening line is, there are a lot of terrible groups out there, and I look like I belong to all of them. Right. And I get it. I right. know it. It makes audiences laugh, but casting directors understand that, too. Yeah. And they tell you out here in this business, if, if you have to understand not how you want to be viewed, mm-hmm. but how the general public views you, and right. then embrace that. Sure. I'm never going to be Iron Man. I have to <laughs> sure. wrap my head around that and go, what's the character that they are going to see me as? Yeah. Let's master that. And that's yeah. how you're going to be successful, yeah, it's so interesting that Hollywood is viewed, at least from my more conservative upbringing, as like, this is a place where it's about breaking those stereotypes. But then you get here, and it's all about stereotypes. It's about conforming. Yeah. It's absolutely about conforming. Yeah. But the Very people who were breaking the stereotypes either conformed, played the game, yeah. and then tried to break it. Sure. Or got here, realized that it was about getting in line, very corporate America, and they just don't work in the industry anymore. And they live in tents on the <laughs> sure, one one. Right. But they're right. definitely breaking stereotypes. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So. No, they are. They are for sure. So for you, what was the cause you're are you doing improv now, or is that mostly like your improv is happening in your acting? Um, so I, COVID shut everything down. Yeah, uh, right. I was doing improv. I had my own improv class oh, after okay. I went to the groundlings. And I have to tell you, that's the most fun I've ever had in my life. Was having, teaching your own class? Yes. Yeah. Having 19 adults uh-huh. in a room doing these crazy improv games is the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah. It's like that and then being on stage doing comedy. Yeah. Like those are the two things that bring me the most joy. And then probably my daughter somewhere. Down, but, <laughs> but those those things are all, you it know, the, those, those are the, the, the leading stars in my life. So. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So at this moment, no, because right. everything shut down. But I see stuff coming back, right. so... Maybe improv with masks soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be an interesting. Uh, so much about this. reading body language. I know. Have you yeah. done improv? I have. Yeah. yeah, I did. I did improv with comedy sports in Provo, Utah, for about oh, a year, uh, on stage. You no, know, getting getting paid, quote unquote. I was really oh, just cool. earning my uniforms. You know, <laughs> right. they give you for that more corporate kind of comedy stuff. So, um, but yeah, I did it for a while. But I love stand up. I love stand-up a lot. So what drew you to stand-up specifically, other than, you know, kind of this interest from from youth? You know, Michael Rogelio and I were talking about this the other day because we both came from a music background. I was a I was a singer as well. Oh, okay. I was a drummer in a band for a while. I always had again, I always had these like side projects of like creativity, but I never connected that I could do it for a living. I always Uh wanted to, but I never connected it. 
And I used to be a drummer for a while, and I remember before we would play a gig, like my drum set would be set up, and the band, and the amps, and everything, and Rogelio was really connecting with me, going, I remember that I would see my rig set up, and then we would go eat, and I'd come back, look in the back of the room and see that, and there was just this plethora of like instruments on stage, and I would go, that's my drum kit. Yeah. And I'm gonna go up and rock that later. <laughs> it's gonna be so much fun. Sure. And even when I was a drummer in churches, um, I would look at, the, I would sit at the back of the of the church and go, "Man, at ten thirty this morning, I'm gonna <laughs> rock that drum kit," you know? Interesting. <laughs> and and yeah. so I remember getting that vibe, and I remember going to, a, I don't know if it was, a, I went in person, I don't remember if I saw a video, but there was a micro, just a microphone mm-hmm. on stage, just a microphone, and I thought. There's nothing to pound on. There's nothing to strum. There's yeah. nothing to distract. It is just one person in their brain. And they can hold an audience captive for an hour. Like, yeah. that felt like magic to me. Sure, yeah. And I thought, uh, you know, I didn't mind doing a drum solo, right? But I had drums to rely on, right? right. I right. could... There's all kinds of things I could do. Yeah. I had a band with me. I could do all kinds of things. Yeah. And... I remember having a bass player in one of the bands, and he was a really heavy set guy. And he could sing really well. And I asked him one time, would you ever consider being a singer? And he was like, no, I need to hide behind my bass for an insecurity. Interesting. And I remember thinking, there's no way you're hiding behind that bass. But yeah, yeah just right. Me being Not me. physically. Right. Yeah. But I remember going, oh, I'm, am I hiding behind my drum set? Uh huh. Like, what's going on there? And so when you say what drew me to comedy, and I've never even talked about this publicly, but. I think what drew me to comedy was that that idea that it's just a microphone mm. and you can you just have the audience in the palm of your hand. Yeah. Even when it feels like you have lost control, <laughs> sure. You're controlling the chaos. Yeah. And it's just it's an it's it's an absolute blast. And yeah. it scared me a little when I thought about going up there without a drum set, without a guitar, without with even when I was a singer, I had a whole band with me. Right. Um, and I always used to tell little jokes in between songs. And I remember always, no matter what I did, I always tried to make it funny because I enjoy making people laugh. Yeah. And man, that just, that that drew me to it. And so yeah. the first time I started doing it, I was doing, like I said, in small, you know, little small one-off shows. Uh-huh. It's just, it's addictive, man. Yeah. I think I think you know after two or three shows whether this is something you want to do or not. I mean, yeah, it's pretty clear. Yeah, I don't think anyone does this for seven years and goes, "It's not for me." <laughs> I don't. Think You're either so. in it for life, or you stop after three right, shows. Right, you know? right. So. Yeah, I don't know many people who are like, "Ah, oh, I just can't give up the money." You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> I would give it up, but the money's just too good. Right, it pays like, so well. Um, I don't think that's where you are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. So, okay. So, did you sing and play drums at the same time? Never. No. Okay. I can. Sure. At home. But I, I never, I never did. As a performer, I was either a paid drummer in someone else's band, or I was the lead singer of my own band. Gotcha. Yeah, I yeah, never, yeah. I never did both. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, anytime I see a drummer who also sings at the same time, no names are coming to mind right now, but I know they're out there. Don uh, Henley. Uh, is that right? Did I say it right from the Eagles? Oh, yeah. I may, I I'm not be saying his name wrong. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, he's he's a drummer singer. Yeah, that impresses me. It seems like there's a lot of. Up, upper body physical motion that well, would make it it's difficult. It's kind of two separate. It, 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 when I do it in my brain, my brain's in two separate areas at the same time. Yeah. Because the they both just kind of come naturally if you can do both things. Uh huh. And so it's never. It's not. An issue. It wouldn't be that hard. No. Oh, okay. So I shouldn't that. be idolizing it, it, them. No. <laughs> as much no. as I do. I will All say right. this. It's easy, Dane. I we will. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this. When they if if the singing is on a separate time than the drums, it can get more difficult. Oh, I see what you're so saying. So if you're keeping standard time and singing pretty much in time, it's not, it's, like yeah. people tap their foot while they're singing all the time and they're not sure. even drummers or singers. Yeah, right. So it's like that. Oh, it's okay. like tapping your foot while you're singing along with the song. It's not that serious. Got but it. there are some complicated stuff that would make you go, ah, I can't do both of those at the same time. Yeah, and yeah, by the yeah. way, they don't in studio. Right. They'll play their drum track and then they'll go back and sing separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they got to balance the vocals correctly and all that other stuff. So, gotcha. So, okay, so you you go up on stage, you bomb, 
your first time. Thanks up. for reminding them of that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, That's always humbling. humbling. Uh, <laughs> Very. <laughs> that wasn't the only time I bombed. Well, sure. I'm not saying that it is. We don't have to relive every single we, I, one. I can relive, relive my favorite one if you want. <laughs> oh, sure. What was your favorite? Uh, at Ha Ha. You, you, you oh, I have actually not been to the Ha Ha. Really? So you're racist? Yes. Okay. 100%. Yeah. It's, we it's went over that in your podcast. We did. Podcast. We did, yeah. yeah. It's, it tends to be mostly uh, a black club. Uh-huh. and. I went up. I didn't know that. I just went up. A guy booked me there, and um, I go. I go up on stage. For, for some reason, there's only like four people in the yeah. audience. Yeah. And thirty comedians lining sure. the back wall. Right. It and it's a, a random, big room. It's right? a big room. Yeah. And I go up. It's the only time in my life. Even when I bombed my first time, I got a couple of laughs here and there. Okay. This yeah. was the only time. And I don't know if you ever had a set like this. Where it was literal, <laughs> just crickets. Just nothing. The entire time. <laughs> Wow. Stuff that I know has worked before. And that's yeah. part of what hurts as a comedian. You're yeah. like, I've done this 30 times and it worked. Right. And you guys are looking at me like I'm from another planet. Yeah. So I'm doing the jokes and just completely silent. And it, that's like your worst fear when you're coming up as a comedian. Yeah. What if I bomb? What if I bomb? <laughs> right. And it's like you think you die that day. Like yeah, it yeah, feels yeah. like that's when everything you're using, your face catches on fire and yeah. it's the worst thing that could happen to you. And when it actually happened in the moment, I started laughing. Like it was, <laughs> it was so funny to how me. How far in your set did you feel like you were? About two and a half minutes, maybe. Uh-huh. Okay. Still nothing. In a five. In a five. Okay. In a five. Yeah. I'm half, and I'm just going. I started laughing, <laughs> and I, I can only see a couple of people, you know, in the front row. Yeah. And these bright lights on my face, and I just said into the mic, I go, I have never bummed this bad <laughs> in my life. And they didn't even laugh at that. I laughed myself. Really? They didn't laugh. And I hear a guy in the Nothing. back of the room go, run your set, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> and I got back into my set and I did the other two and a half minutes. Yeah. Still no laughs. Wow. I finish and I say, thank you, I'm David C. Smalley. Yeah. I walk off stage. And the booker's waiting for me. And I'm sure. thinking, well, I, this, is it. this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, he, I go off stage and he goes, hey, will you stay and do a second show? And I went, <laughs> for real? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> he goes, no, man. He goes, it's, it's a tough crowd, dude. I can tell your stuff is good. Will you stay and do a second show? Wow. And I was like, I was going to go kill myself. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah. I guess I'll wait. Yeah, yeah I guess yeah, I'll like, hold go off and see, <laughs> see how the second show goes. It, right. It, only time I've ever been asked to stay for a second show that I that wasn't already booked. That you know is what I mean? amazing. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. was like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. I wish I knew the guy's name. And so I, I stayed. He goes, I, I started to walk away. He goes, you got to promise me one thing. Yeah. I said, what? He goes, do the exact same jokes. <laughs> and I was like, no, are you serious? He goes, yeah, wow. do, do it for me, okay? And yeah. I said, okay. We st- a whole new crowd came in, an actual audience. I did yeah. the same set and had a great set. Oh man! And that made that. Cha- I'm so glad that guy it's like did a that. Yoda move from that guy. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it changed the way. Now I get it why comedians will be doing a set, at least the experienced ones, and the crowd's not laughing and they're like, "It's it's your fault." Yeah. Right. Like, cause I'm hilarious. <laughs> this, isn't this, is, this is on me. This is. I've done this. I have yeah, a track yeah, yeah. record. Right. You know, I get it now. So it it made me not be. First of all, maybe not fear bombing. Yeah. yeah. And once you're once you don't fear that, you get much more calm and, and yeah. much more. Uh, I have fun now. It's something I enjoy doing, not something I am worried about succeeding at. It's this is for me. I'm here for me. Right. And I I, I, I tell the audience that. Yeah. So when it when it bombed, this ad wasn't for you. Yeah. I did that for me. So it's fine. <laughs> so, I'm still having a good time. Right. Yeah. I'm paid right. for this. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. That's. That was the worst, the worst bomb, but also one of the best experiences in comedy. I've ever yeah, had. well, that's a great roller coaster, which is stand up in a nutshell, right? You had all of stand up, it feels like, in one night, right? Which is like the worst <laughs> bomb to a great show. Yeah, you know, the comic set. yelling at me from the back to just run my set <laughs> really put it all into perspective. And I hear that guy's voice now. Anytime something's not going well, yeah. I hear it. Just run your set, oh man. And I'm like, gosh. just get through it, bro. Just get get through your set. That's funny. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. Basically, stuff. like, don't try to do crowd work now. <laughs> Just do your jokes. Yeah, that'd been that'd have been see a, what happens. So where are you from? <laughs> yeah. What do you do for a living? No. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's yeah. great. So what what brought you back to stand up after the initial set that you had? Oh, the first so you one. You sort of took a break. No, it was when I went to the Reason Rally and they asked me to MC. Oh, that was your they first one. They asked me to MC, and when I came back, uh, I, I was just supposed to host and just introduce a comedian. Yeah. But I thought. Listen, I can do it. The MC has the easiest <laughs> job because your job is to be the least funny person out there. Uh-huh. 
and you can bail on your set anytime you want. Like, yeah. You go out there and tell two jokes and nobody laughs. You can yeah. say, well, let's get the real comedians up here. And here's the nice people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you can bail on it. And if it's going well, you can milk it and then warm up the crowd for the comedian. So right. it, it's a great way for, for comics to start out. And that's what happened. I, I went up there, I had a little set list written down. And because I was the MC, I got to tape it to the bar stool so nobody uh-huh. else could do anything. So I was fine. I was calm. I was I was yeah. ready to go and and it did and I did really well. Sure. And there were five hundred people. Who do you know does an actual like first time back comedy show for five hundred? Yeah. Like that's a massive show. Yeah. And, that's wild. And it, it went great. And I was like, this is this, this is my yeah. new love. Like this is what I absolutely love. So, gotcha. Yeah. So and but you'd been doing the podcast from almost the beginning. Of your like showbiz career, yeah. It like. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. Uh, I would say 2010 is when the podcast really launched. I mean, I had done, I had been on the backside. I'd been an audio engineer and a TV producer and a voice actor uh-huh. since 2003. Oh, okay. And for a television network, and then I moved out into in front of the camera at that point. Yeah. But yeah, um, the podcast what came more out of a need for respectful discussion uh-huh. on t- on tough topics yeah where I felt like people were just um, insulting one another and belittling one another and I was like eh, there's a there's a better way to do this and I, I podcasting wasn't even a thing I technically had a podcast before the word podcast existed uh-huh in 2003 I did have an internet radio show oh okay that was archived yeah and it was again I had a full time job and then I would do this on Thursday nights and it was about hip hop and comedians, and we would bring comedians oh, on okay. and talk to them, and we would kind of roast them and then bring them to a live show once a month. And it was uh-huh. just, it was this really cool thing we did. And um, you could archive the internet radio for later listening. And this was 2003. I think the word podcast was invented in 2004. <laughs> so when yeah. I came back to it in 2010 and was like, I'm going to do. And in another internet radio show, they were like, the word is podcast now. I was like, <laughs> like oh, the, whatever it is. Whatever. That's, I'm <laughs> that's gonna go what I'm going to go back to what I was doing <laughs> yeah. before the word existed. And, yeah, I just I felt like people weren't really respecting one another. They weren't um, – people were definitely not willing to change their minds because right. immediately when there was any sort of challenge on either side, the walls would go up. Yeah. And it just became throwing insults over the wall as opposed to listening to one another. And I knew that I could lighten the mood a little bit with a little bit of humor, but also still get my point across and have really good debates with people. Yeah. Uh, if they wanted to get in the weeds, we could do that. And if they wanted to talk about where we had common ground, we could do that too. But sure. the primary focus of the show is really not about me or the guest. Right. It's about the people listening using these skills to talk to their family members and their friends and their uncle and the crazy guy at Thanksgiving and yeah. how do you cross those those lines and have those conversations and when should you not like yeah. when is a good time to stop having the conversation and I recently had one where I was just like there's nothing more to do here like I, I reached <laughs> a dead end and went yeah. I tried yeah. but there's it was about the vaccine oh and interesting just, I hit a wall and this was on your podcast no or just this, this was actually normal conversation did somebody. not get paid for this one this was <laughs> This Took was, one for the team. Yeah, you? this was yeah. heartbreaking too because it was um, my daughter's best friend's mom, uh-huh. and so my daughter is trying to hang out with her best friend, and I'm going, wait till she's vaccinated. Yeah, and my daughter's like, they're really hardcore Trump voters, and they're very anti-vaccine. Interesting. And I'm like, well, let me talk to her. And my daughter's like, not oh, no. you, Dad. Not yeah, you. Don't, don't. yeah. I was like, I literally do this for a living. <laughs> I can do this. Let me talk to them. Yeah. And they're very sweet. Sure. They're very loving people. Sure. Awesome people. Um, and, you know, the first the first round, I don't know if I'm going to go into it or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. No, Basically, can. the first round was, um, uh, we don't know what's in them. There's all kinds of craziness. Right. Micro tri- mi- microchips, <laughs> tracking, yeah. all the conspiracy stuff. Yeah. And I did a little video screen share of my own phone, and I was like, I want you to try this. Mm-hmm. Go to your settings, go to this, go to this, go to location settings, go to significant locations or under privacy, and you can see every place you've been for the past three weeks. Yeah. It'll tell you <laughs> how long you were there, yeah. how long it took you to get there. It was an eight minute walk to Gelson's, it was a 15 minute, 15 right. minute drive to the movie theater, whatever it is. And she was blown away by that. And sure. I was like, you have given your authorization to be tracked by having this iPhone. Yeah. When you click agree on terms and conditions. So let's get that out of the way. 
um, they, there's no need to sneak it into vaccines. <coughs> no, they've got which it. a lot of people are scared of. Right. They don't have to make you line up for it. You right. Know, they it. And I was like, as far as the unknown ingredients, I was like, does it bother you that it has, and I listed a bunch of complicated ingredients, like sodium bicoordinate something, something, <laughs> sure. and all these scary sounding things. And she replies back, we're over text, she replies back, and she's like, yes, how terrifying is that? I was like, that is Velveeta. <laughs> yeah, right. I gave you the ingredients to Velveeta cheese. You have no clue what you're eating, right. but I know you eat Velveeta cheese. Right. And she's like, you got me, I do eat Velveeta cheese. <laughs> I was like, everybody eats Velveeta cheese. Like, of course, like, there's so much crap. If the yeah. government wanted to sneak secret ingredients into stuff, they wouldn't have you line up for a scary poke in the arm. They would no. sprinkle it over Cheez-Its or, yeah. or put it in Dr. Pepper yeah. or something. Or sell that, it to you on the streets as LSD. Right. I mean, Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? And so yeah. then she was like, okay, good point. And we were just checking things off one by one by one. Mm-hmm. And we get to the end of it, and she goes, yeah, I get that they're safe. And, oh, by the way, I sent her a video of Donald Trump saying people should get the vaccine. Right. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, yeah. And she goes, yeah. yeah, I know that he's for it. He's for it because it helps millions of people. And I went, yeah. Great. I was like, so you acknowledge it saves lives? She goes, oh, it's very good. I know it saves lives. Yeah. I was like, okay, and so we're not worried about the tracking? She's like, no, you kind of took care of that. I was like, and we're good with the ingredients? She's like, yeah, you're right. I don't know what I'm putting in my body a lot of times. I was like, all right, so what is it? We're just not vaccine people. Beautiful. And I said, let's, what if I try to use that logic and said, you know what? I know that condoms right. prevent diseases mm-hmm. and prevent unwanted pregnancies. I'm just not a condom person. Yeah. Would you accept that? And she's like, of course not. And I said, what about seatbelts? I'm like, I know seatbelts save yeah. tons of lives, but I heard about one guy in Minnesota that got stuck in his car because of a seatbelt, and he actually died when he wouldn't have. Therefore, I'm not a seatbelt person. And her response was, okay, I thought we were having a friendly discussion. <laughs> and she started checking out. And I'm like, look, right. at some point, if all of the evidence is in front of your face yeah. and you still completely refuse reality, I don't know what else to do. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, and people email me and go, they tell me conversations happen to them, and they go, David, what do I do? And I'm like, there is no answer to that. Right. Like, some people just will not budge. And yeah. It's, it's incredibly, that's what she point. said. And I'm yeah. like, well, but. <laughs> but no. But one we of disagree us, to disagree. One of us agrees with reality and science. <laughs> the other one acknowledges reality and then goes, not interested in reality. Right. And that's, that's hard. Would you have felt better if she was like, I'm just a free rider. In economics, there are free riders. I'm ba- I'm, I'm betting that everyone else is going to get the vaccine so I won't need it. You know? No. You know I mean, what I mean? Still so- I know what you mean. <laughs> I get it. That's funny. But I'm still in this because this was only a few days ago. So That's, I'm not... All right. It's too, it's too soon. It's too, it's too soon. raw. Fair enough. I'm, we'll I'm, I'm thinking of ideas as I'm talking. <laughs> what else can I say to her? Right. To, you know, yeah, there's it's nothing. It's so hard. And I don't yeah. want to tell my daughter she can't see her friend. Right. And, and, and then we go... And there's hope for her friend. Right. And then yeah. we go, oh, masks only. Well, they want to go eat. They want to go to the mall. They want to... Have dinner across from yeah. one another. They want to have it's conversations all outside. Like this. Do it all outside then. Right. Six feet apart. Six feet apart. <laughs> and are you going to trust a couple of 16-year-olds to actually do that? I mean, no. we trust 16-year-olds with a lot of stuff. But... Do you have a 16-year-old? Not yet. All right, then. But I, I was 16 well, once. <laughs> well, you were, a, you were a 16-year-old Mormon. That's I was. totally uh, different. Is it? I don't trust different? 16-year-old Mormons. Yeah. Sure. Let's, uh, 16-year-old atheist? Not so much. <laughs> not I a mean, chance. Come on. No. Uh, so what have you learned the most about people's faith or mentality in your podcast? Oh, wow. What a loaded question to get me in trouble. <laughs> well, or just um, maybe something significant to you that you hadn't really appreciated before. It's not really that I appreciate. It's not something positive, to be honest with you. It's, yeah. it's that, just like with the vaccine discussion, um, that, that facts are no match for emotion. Mm. Like yeah. when someone says, you know, my mom died and I want to see her again in heaven and that's why I believe. Those are non sequiturs in the logic world. Those do not. Sure. You wanting something to be true has nothing to do with its right. evidence. Right? right. Right. But that's not when someone says my mom died and I want to see her in heaven. That's not the time to open an evolution book and go, yeah, but see. <laughs> We came yeah. from a monkey. Right. No. Right, no, right, right. No. You have to meet people on the emotional level that they are currently in. Sure. And then try to reason with them from that perspective. Yeah. But I guess that, that facts just don't matter to people who are wrapped up in emotion. And trying to get people to not be emotional 
about a very emotional topic right. is nearly impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. Over my 10, 11, 12 years of doing this, I've had possibly over a thousand, maybe more, uh, emails come in to say I was a fundamentalist, hardcore conservative Republican. I was anti gay. I was this. this. Yeah. I listened to your show and I hated you for the first two years. <laughs> sure. And now I'm an atheist and I'm liberal <laughs> and I'm voting for Joe Biden. And <laughs> that's happened yeah, yeah. a lot and I'm so thankful for that. But the biggest things are. Do you get the inverse? The I listen to you, I love you, and now no. I'm a fundamental religious no. person. <laughs> Never. No, I'm shocked. No. I'm shocked no. that doesn't no, no, no. happen. I've, I've had a couple of people write me. I think they do it just to piss me off, but they'll write me and say, I was on the fence for a minute uh-huh. after listening to your crazy ideas. I'm going back to church. <laughs> but I think, I think, I, to me, it's just a yeah, joke. Like, that's great. Yeah, I think they're just trying to irritate me. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had someone say, like, I was an atheist and then became a believer because of your show. Right, right, Never. right. Never. Um, there was one time many, many years ago where I had a Christian guest, the same Christian guest on multiple times. Yeah. His name's John Christie. We did a film together called My Week in Atheism, and it's on Amazon. Oh, it's on uh-huh. Amazon. I think it's Amazon Prime. You get it for free. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the listeners reached out to him, and he like privately talked with him for like a year, uh-huh. and I think she ended up joining a church with him or something. But gotcha. I think it was more, when I went back and looked at the conversation, she had said something like, someone in her family died, and then there was a lightning strike next to her, and <laughs> it, yeah. like the only thing that didn't get destroyed was a Bible, and it was really weird. So it was all it signs was so, from God it, it that was she so, needed to come it back. It was so coincidental, yeah, yeah that yeah, she yeah. thought it was signs from God that she needed to come right. back. And so... <laughs> But I know who's to say. Listen, I know atheists who believe (laughs) really bizarre things. Right, right. Like people have said in my email that they can control the weather. Right. That they don't believe in God. Or that they can make rainbows appear. Or that they summon dead people to speak with them in their living room. These are all real things. Yeah, yeah. That's why when people start saying, well, you atheists believe, I go, stop. (laughs) That's a big group. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Atheist is the answer to one question. There's tons of people out there who claim things they can't prove that are that are atheists. Yeah, so and see, that's the way I feel about religious people, too. Yeah. And it's like, oh, all you Christians believe. So, well, exactly. it's a big, that's a big umbrella, mm-hmm. you know, big group of people. Yeah. So um, don't look at my Twitter. Right. <laughs> a little bit of that going on <laughs> in there. Oh, that's great. Oh, my gosh. So you're, what's your religious background? Because you grew up religious. Mm-hmm. So you grew up Catholic? No, well... I, I would say Christian. Okay. Just Christian. My mom um, was baptized Catholic as a kid. Uh-huh. Or maybe, I think she was Baptist and then went Catholic. Oh, okay. Either way, it was a big no-no. Yeah. And it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. She went Catholic by choice because mm-hmm. the big Bible I grew up with was the Catholic Bible. Okay. It had the, the Apocrypha. Like a king, oh. No, oh, it, like it the, included the Apocrypha, gotcha. the books that other Christians do not recognize. Don't accept, right. Which was... Incidentally, one of my first uh, like red, red issue, flags. Yeah, yeah, they're both called Holy Bible. Right. There's a copyright issue here because right. these are not the same book. Right. And then I read um, Jehovah's Witness Bible, mm-hmm. and there's just stuff missing. Yeah. They just take whole verses yeah, out. They, they go, we don't like right. that, and it's just gone. Right. Yeah. They pick and, and choose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and it's, but they don't just say we don't. Fundamentalist Christians have the decency to leave it in and just <laughs> skip over it when they're reading. We right. just turn advantage and we we'll just flip it. Sure, but Jehovah's Witnesses were like, "We're just going to erase it. Yeah, like, we're just going to not have it printed." Yeah, and I started noticing people that called themselves Christians did not believe the same things that the other people. Right, and with atheists, we there's no doctrine, there's no book of atheism, yeah. there's no set of beliefs or rituals or. But with the Bible, if you guys are Christians, you're Christians, and there's a whole book and doctrine and things that you're sure, supposed to believe. Sure, sure. So when I'm sitting across from a Christian in my studio and I go, so you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins? And they go, no. Oh. Like, I go, what? what? <laughs> Jay Moore did that, by the way. Is that right? Me, Jay Moore was in the studio and he goes, I said, you believe Jesus died for your sins? Because he was kind of bagging on me for being an atheist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, so let's start at the, at the basic. You right. believe Jesus Christ died for your sins? He goes, no. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, Jesus Christ died because he set himself, he set himself as a king against uh, Caesar. Because he was killed by the Romans. For, and I was like, but the whole point was wow. your savior. And he's like, nah, he, he, said he, was a, he said he was the king of men, and that's why he got killed. And, and I was so like, oh. Is he Christian? So how does that you tell fall me. Like, into the umbrella? What he because, says was, yeah. <laughs> this is something we laughed about and fought about, <laughs> is he says, I don't have to uh, uh, confirm those beliefs, 
but if I call myself a Christian, you have to accept that I'm a Christian. He's like, that's up to me what, what I call myself. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Fair. Sure. Yeah, but no, because... <laughs> well, I mean, okay, as long look, as he's being then, clear about what on. definition he's using... No, then I'm the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. Right. Right. Because well, reality I think this is the matter. social issue well, that everyone's dealing with right now. I know. It gets into gender. We could go... Well, gender is not as cut and dried as Christian. <laughs> is it not? No, because isn't is it believing <laughs> that Jesus... Do you have parts on you that make you think an about atheist? It. Well, think about it. <laughs> is it... Is it Jesus Christ rising from the dead and dying for your sins, a basic fundamental requirement of Christianity? That's what I would have thought. I mean, I wouldn't call Jay Moore a Christian if he doesn't believe that, that he's saved out of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He's also very good at wrestling. I believe that. He's I would a, not want to wrestle him. Well, okay. <laughs> but I don't know that I have to wrestle him to not call him a Christian. <laughs> Maybe that's part of the prerequisite. I just wanted to say that so that you only say he's not a Christian to me. Not in Fair front enough. of him at a comedy club. Yeah, so, I would never pick on him yeah, at a comedy don't. club. Bad idea. No, 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 no. It's not the place. Yeah, but it's an interesting concept because it, it would yeah. make me go. I push back, and he goes, "Yeah, well, why do you get to? Why do you yeah. get to tell me I'm not a Christian because I don't? Well, if you, you don't believe Jesus died for your sins, that's to me. Yeah, I agree. And again, with I you. have to say to me, but when they baptized me, yeah, I did get baptized, and when I was baptized. The preacher said, do you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you may enter the kingdom of heaven? Right. And when I said yes, he said, then, comma, you are hereby <laughs> saved in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yeah. I was dumb. And if I'd have been like, nah, more because he think so. put himself against the king <laughs> right. uh, called right. Caesar, I don't think he would have been like, oh, that's right. good then. enough. <laughs> you know, no, he'd have been like, get out of here. Yeah, you're, not, yeah, you you're not, clearly not ready. Someone made right. a mistake. Right, so, I don't know. Jay's, a, Jay's an interesting guy, but right. I don't know where I was going. Well, I think in the sense of, uh, well, we were talking about your religious background, and oh, yeah, um, yeah. that led into that discussion. But you were you were baptized Catholic or no, Baptist? No, I went to my own. I went, so I got saved in what's called the fifth quarter. So it was after oh, a football okay. game. Uh huh. The religious group came to the football game and said, "Hey, we're having a teen party after after the football oh, game." Oh, nice. Which I think is inappropriate to be honest. Okay. With you. Uh, but I just and this went. was in Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, very common. Yeah. And I went there. And it was late at night on a Saturday, and a lot of people went to parties afterwards anyway, so our sure. parents weren't really expecting us home. And I was like 15, and uh, they did an altar call. And uh -huh. I felt what the does that mean, an altar call? Oh, you don't know? I don't know. Oh, wow. It's not really part of like oh, Mormon yeah. theology. The It sounds Pentecostal-ish a little. Like Funny. This. So when you have your eight-year-old stand up and do the their, give their testimony, uh -huh. it's kind of like that. I mean, it's not a requirement that they do that. I thought they have to at the age of eight or something. No, 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 no. no. Okay. So it's, uh, testimonies are always voluntary. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the dad holds a gun. <laughs> yeah, Sweet. right. Sweet. Now, I will say there is a practice within the Mormon culture where the parents will walk a child up to the pulpit and, tell and them whisper yeah. to them. And that does make me uncomfortable. Yeah. So I've not done that with my own kids. Oh, they it's, actually give their own testimony? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. My son, he's like, he's six now. And uh, when we were meeting in person, so he was like five, he just oh. turned to me and he was like, I want to go bear my testimony. I was like, great. I have no idea what you're going to say, but you're wow. going up on your you're own. the first one I've talked to. Yeah. And oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Repeatedly, people say, yeah, I was yeah, heard it. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Because it's not, to me, now I'm not trying to judge other people, but to me, it's not quite sincere. John 7.24 so. says you can pass righteous judgment, so you're okay. All right, all right. You're clear, as far Oof. as John's concerned. You can well, judge all you want. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the idea that... Um, I, I don't know. What was, what was the question? Well, you were baptized and then altar call. You were talking about this. The altar, altar call. call. Sorry. The yeah. idea. The idea uh, of the altar call is that they basically say the preacher gives his whole sermon and says, "If you want to, you know, be free of your sins and come down, and you can come down and confess your sins before man, so that Jesus will gotcha. confess before the Father." So okay. Basically, they just want to know your business. Yeah, they right. They want to know how right. many people you've had sex with. Black they want to know all the all the, all the <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. Tell yeah, us yeah, everything yeah. that you that that you've done wrong. Right. And and we'll judge you for it okay. because we can. Sure. And yeah, and it's that's a role what you're supposed to, to do. do so. Yeah. Right. And so I went down mostly because you know I was feeling it. I felt like yeah. okay, there's the Holy Spirit. I do feel. Later, I realize you know they're very charismatic. They're taught in preacher school how to much like a psychic uh -huh. speak to you in a way that's so generic that you interpret it as personal uh -huh. on your own. And um, 
I went down and, and ended up joining the church and started playing drums for the church. And oh, then, okay. And then transferred to different churches and yeah, um, all of that. But yeah, that's how they got me. They got me after <laughs> at an after, after, after school game. event. Yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. And then what led you, I know you've talked about this a little bit on your own podcast, but was it like you never really connected spiritually with a God or was it more of these inconsistencies that you noticed that led you away? from your faith. In 2010, I published a book called Baptized Atheist. Mm -hmm. And the reason I called the book that is because it was the moment I was baptized. Oh, okay. Like, when he said that to me, and that's why I know the script so well, is I wrote it in my book over and over. I read the audio book that's on Audible, and I've told the story a lot. But when he said that, do you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins so that you may enter the kingdom of heaven? I said... Yes, because I knew I was supposed to, and everyone's watching. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> but it was literally as I went underwater. It felt like I was under there forever. I know he just dips me, you know? Yeah. But that moment felt, first of all, it felt incredibly unfair. Mm-hmm. How does punishing and torturing the innocent pardon the guilty? Mm-hmm. Makes no sense. Why would a loving, fair, just God do that to his own son right so bizarre why would he make that the plan to begin with yeah and why haven't i thought about this before now that i'm underwater right right. now that i've gotten myself and i come up out of the water i'm like oh like i don't know about any of this and so i i i walk over i get out of the out of the baptistry i go over i'm still dripping yeah i'm standing there dripping there's a whole line of us baptists do it as ritual you know so You just everybody. Did they change your clothes? Were you like in all white, or did um, they just baptize you right after the game? They don't the give game? us any <laughs> special underwear for sure. But, right. Well, but, uh, I would hope not. That's but I patented but <laughs> by the Masons. Anyway, um, yeah. no. If it's patented, it's that, patented. That's deep. That's yeah, that's, that's a deep cut. That's, that's for the real, real listeners. Yeah. That's 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 deep. So um, I don't remember. I feel like they. I think I, they told me to bring like a t-shirt and shorts. Uh-huh. And then I put the white robe over it. Okay. And then they baptize you, so it's like a wet t-shirt contest. <laughs> right. And they nice. can tell exactly yeah. what your tank top yeah. and blue shorts are. And then they cut you from the team. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I'm standing there dripping. Yeah. And the way I write it in the book is I say, the preacher must have seen the doubt on my face. Oh. Because he didn't even look at me. Yeah. He walks up next to me. He stands next to me. I remember him towering over me. And he leans down. And this moment changed my life. He leans down and he goes... You know, son, you can't just say you believe. You have to know it to be true in your heart. Wow. And he walked away. Yeah. And I immediately went, I don't believe. You're right. I was saying it. I don't know it to be true in my heart. I think it's true. Yeah. I want it to be true. Yeah. I really, really want to see all my dead relatives again and go to a paradise. Sure. But I don't know anything to be true in my heart. I haven't done enough research. Yeah. And so... I started researching, reading the Bible cover to cover at 15 years old where I started anyway. Yeah. And then they had me door knocking and soul winning. And yeah. I remember knocking on this woman's door, this elderly black woman. She opens her door and I said, I'd like to talk to you about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Boom! And the door just slams <laughs> in my face. And I hear yeah. her on the other side of the door go, honey, you need Jesus. Nice. Because when she slammed the door, I thought, oh, Satan. Yeah, she hates Satan yeah. worshiper. Right. And when she says, honey, you need Jesus... I'm like 16 at this point, and I'm going, what if she has the correct version of Jesus right. over there, and I'm this idiot pulling people out of the correct faith? Right. How do you know what the hell you're talking about? Go read the Bible. I feel like I'd been given a jersey yeah. and pushed out onto the field, and I didn't know what the ball looked like <laughs> or what any of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, any of the rules. I'm like, why do they do this to kids? Yeah. And I was like, I know what I'll do. I'm a, I'm a good person, damn it. Yeah. I'm going to save this. I'm going to solve the problems. I'm going to read the entire Bible, figure out which religion is the right one, and help people be saved. That's right. what I wanted to do. There I'm like, go. I know what I'll do. I'll make a note of all the things that don't make sense. Uh huh. And I go, all right, Genesis 1, <laughs> chapter 1. <laughs> How old is the earth? <laughs> yeah. We get today, we have three mornings and yeah. three evenings with no sun. Yeah. And I go, yeah. all right, that's the first thing. I'm just going to write that down. <laughs> And, right. we'll, and we'll go from there. Right. And turns out Genesis is poetry. Yeah. It's written as poetry. It was never meant to be taken literally. Right. Most fundamentalist believers do not acknowledge that. And that was the start of my journey. And yeah. 
I, it took me about 14 years. I went through deep dive study, not only reading the Bible twice, yeah. um, but speaking with theology professors, having little local debates and recording it and then fixing all my own errors. My blog was a big part of it in 2008, um, which ended up leading me to my book that I released in 2010 and ultimately the podcast. So you could say I've been on a journey for... God, almost yeah. 20 years just yeah. trying to, you know, figure out what I do believe and, and what the truth is out there. And that's kind of how I got here. Gotcha. Interesting. Wow. I don't know if that's a long-winded answer yeah. to your no, question. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's, that's great. That's kind of what I was so, doing. So n never really, like, a conviction in your heart that what you had been taught or at least wanted to believe was true. Um, there was a hope, it sounds like, you know, a desire that it be. But not ever it's really hard, a connection. It's hard to tell the difference, I think, for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Because it, there were times where I would have told you I connected with God. Uh huh. There were times where I spoke to God sitting on the edge of my bed and felt like he spoke back to me. Okay. Um, there were times when I had this understanding with God. And after speaking with so many different Christians... I realized there was one common denominator. Mm -hmm. Humans rarely agree on things. Yeah. Yet, they never disagree with God. Uh huh. You never hear a, a Christian go, I know God disagrees with me on this, <laughs> but here's my viewpoint anyway. Yeah. They always think that God agrees with them. Okay. Yet, none of these Christians, none of these people really, agree on much of anything. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, if... My thoughts and my own desires and my own opinions are living within my own cognition, uh -huh. are living within my own imagination. And God also just happens to magically agree with everything in those parts of my brain. Maybe that's where God lives too. Maybe, uh -huh. maybe it wasn't that, that God created man in his own image. Maybe it was the other way around. Yeah. And that made me start sort of cracking into other people's minds and going... Why do you believe that there shouldn't be interracial marriage? Right. You, know, God you think God agrees with you on that? That question is something that I wish Christians would ask other Christians more often. Yeah. When there's a disagreement between a liberal Christian and, and a conservative Christian about trans bathroom rights or about universal right. basic income or about medical insurance. Just ask, do you think God would agree with you on that? Yeah. That answer should make them rethink the whole concept <laughs> Of yeah. where God exists. I'll say as an atheist, God does exist uh -huh. in the minds of, <laughs> of people who believe. believe in him. Yeah. But it's there are many different versions of that. Interesting. God. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think of it as a, uh, a disconnect between, or an inability for people to separate what they believe from what like their church teaches or okay. from what like the gospel teaches. Oh, you yeah. Know what uh, I mean? Well, there are a lot of people that will say, I, I disagree with my preacher. Right. But they won't say, I disagree with God. Right. No, no, no. Of course not. You know, and if you point stuff out in the Old Testament that was atrocious behavior by God. Sure. And you say, God did these terrible things. Because rep, they deserved it. Right. <laughs> 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 this is rated R, man, without any curse words. This is terrible for children. Uh, yeah, those are not kids. Those are not made for kids. Those those Amalekites really had it coming, right? Yeah. Those, those, those nursing babies and infants that got stomped out. I mean, you know, if you're not going to listen, they just, he knows. He knows when you're already lost. First Samuel 15, uh, 3. First Samuel 15, <laughs> just go read it for yourself. In case yeah. you're Googling Amalekites, right. what's going on? Right, no, the Old Testament is a tough book. But when you bring that up to people, yeah. at least New Testament Christians today, They'll say, well, that was back then. Right, right, uh, right. But the, the answer but God to that, doesn't change. Malachi 3.6 yeah. says, God, I, the Lord, do not change. So right. now we have a whole new problem about God's consistency. Right. And so what political, you know, I started writing a book called "You Would You Would uh, 13 Reasons You Would Never Vote for God. Uh-huh. And I ended up, when Trump won 2016, <laughs> the publisher called me and goes, apparently they will. <laughs> They will vote for a tyrant. Oh, my god! They gosh. will. And, and it, it stopped my book deal. Is that right? Yeah, it really did. He's like, you, wow. you're wrong. He's you're, like, because all can't the, sell this now. Right. All the reasons were basically like, you know. You could have just changed it a little, well, we you know? Well, we tried, but it was, it was, too, it was too clear. Yeah. It was all about 
the politics. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He said if you'd have been here about a year before, we would have done it, and then people would be talking about the book again. Yeah. But he's like, we just missed it. We're too late. Yeah. <laughs> too late and... and <laughs> Man, it was just a bad. It was a bad. That's day. rough. Yeah, that's rough. And maybe now I can do it. And so you'd never vote for God again. Maybe thirteen Although reasons. Although he never... wants to run again. I know. So you better get that book out <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> right? You know. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, interesting. Well, so what have you loved about your podcast, and what have you hated about your podcast? Is there anything that you you know mm. wish you could change at this point about it? And maybe we'll end with that question. What I love is all of the people that I've uh, connected with and met. I feel like I'm retiring from my podcast now. I, <laughs> no, you're not. No. It's I, still it feels weird strong. like I'm saying goodbye. No, um, no, no, no. Uh, it's a rebirth of your podcast, really, <laughs> if anything. Um, it's been resurrected. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice. Um, I didn't realize your audience was that big. Uh, okay. <laughs> they're, they're, no, that, they're not. They're, they're massive enough to resurrect. Yeah. Their the faith world. is strong, though. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it on over. And any guest, by the way, any people listening or watching who want to be a guest on my show, I prioritize believers. I would prefer to not talk to atheists. So yeah. if you want to talk about your faith uh, and answer some respectfully offered challenges to your faith, right? Can I just go to davidcsmalley.com, click be a guest, yeah, uh, and fill out the form. I'd love to talk to you. And I had a great experience on your show. Thank you. I thought it was fantastic. Thank the you. thing that I will say for listeners is that if you're going to be a dick, expect hard challenges back. Yeah. If you're going to be nice, it's going to be a very civil conversation. Absolutely. I, I. It's really weird that you say that, but I, be, I'm i the host of the show. It literally is my name is the name of the show. Yeah. But I let the guests determine the temperament of the show. Yeah. And I've noticed that in listening to your show. Yeah. When you get someone who's like, no, 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 this is the way it goes. Yeah. That's when you tend to ramp it up a bit. Yeah. I, like, I'm not going to I don't be, think so. Yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, which is fair. Yeah. I think that's absolutely. totally fair. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, so I would say my favorite part is the, the people that I've, I've, I've met. I have, I would say... What there's five hundred and what thirty three episodes now. Yeah, usually two to three hours long, and only two guests maybe that I don't speak to anymore. Uh huh. Like most of them have become my friends. Yeah. And one guy was a really angry Russian guy who just refused to answer my questions. Sure. And the other one's Brian Fisher <laughs> from American Family Radio. Interesting. Who I was just trying to explain what people mean. By the concept of privilege, yeah, I want him to understand it. You say that one more time, <laughs> David. I will hang up this phone. And I was he like, did. I just, yeah, he did. Yeah. I was like, I just, you're not gonna come on my show and tell me what words not to use, number right? One. Right. Number two, I know that that makes you angry, so I want to explain what they mean by privilege. Click. Yeah. And he was just done. Yeah. We talked again on Twitter. It's a by fascinating the way. Uh, interview. Thanks. Yeah. We talked again on Twitter the other day, and. He just kept saying, I'll come back on your show, but you better not use the word privilege. And I was like, Brian, I want to explain it to you. He's like, nope, I don't need it. And I was like, so you're refusing to learn from me? I'm open to learning from you. He's like, what would you like to learn from me? And I was like, anything you want to teach me. But he just would not right. be open to I mean, to how it. dare you mansplain to him what, <laughs> what privilege is? And the fact He's that he gonna... would make that demand... Yeah. Is sort of case in point. Right. <laughs> of right. The problem. I have a Stanford <laughs> master's degree. I don't need you telling me. Uh, okay, I kind of see where we're going here. Yeah. But, yeah. um, and I would say the thing I would change, the, I don't know, man. Um, I wish I wish in the beginning I would have would have started it with my name mm. as opposed to calling it Dogma Debate. Um, I wish I would have had more comics on early on. Uh-huh. Because making the transition, it's, it's difficult to make a transition... Uh, from religious debate to comedy when it's always been both. Yeah. From the beginning, it's been both. But, <clears throat> but they, people think I'm, I'm trying to transition out of it into comedy and I'm, I'm just trying to change the branding so that it accurately represents what the show is. Right. People come on <laughs> with religious beliefs and their conversation's exactly like this. Yeah. We push back, we have fun, and then we go to lunch, and yeah. it's a blast. Like it's you don't have to hate people you disagree with, and, right. and that's kind of the whole point of the show. So I guess my regrets around the show, um, I just have to do with people shying away from it early on because it said dogma debate and it seemed contentious. Uh huh. And the people who cracked that anyway and went, "Let's see what it's about," was like, "Oh, I'm so glad." Yeah. But I think more people would have been open to it if it didn't have that title. Yeah. 
Well, it's a tough balance because you want something that's going to be clickable in this day and age. You want right. something that's going to draw people in. But but at the same time, yeah, you don't want to necessarily give them a sour taste immediately. Right. You know, right. Like it, it, your it, baptism experience. Because, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. The idea behind uh, the concept of debating dogma even calling it a dogma in the very beginning feels like religious people are being insulted when that's right. actually the antithesis of the entire show. That's, right. That's the point is to not insult people. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Well, and yeah. you do a good job, too, of pointing out where, as an atheist yourself, you found yourself getting into a dogma mm-hmm. that is more atheist. Yeah. Or, right? or political. Right. Or with, you know, eating meat or not eating meat. Sure. Um, people can be dogmatic about all sorts of things. And that's yeah. what I tried to tell myself with the name of the show. Like, I can keep it this way. Because sometimes I would just talk to vegans. And I would talk to right. to people who were, like, meat activists. That we should eat everything <laughs> that moves. And, yeah. And people invited me to pig farms in Iowa to look behind the scenes and, and do interviews on a you know cow farm, a dairy farm. And it had nothing to do with religion. But people were right. like, I like the way you think. Let me bring you out. So kind of an investigative journalist. So there's tons of content out there for people yeah. to... I just... I like to do an investigation, inspect something, get to the truth. Yeah. That's really what the show's about. It's about getting to the truth. So people have come on the show and said they, they believe in uh, that, that crystals have healing powers. Right. So we blindfolded her <laughs> with her consent, by the way. <laughs> yeah. With yeah, her yeah, consent. Yeah. Okay. And we put different things in her hand <clears throat> Yeah. to see where she could feel the energy. And the turns out the most energetic crystal on the planet yeah. is a plastic bottle cap. Interesting. That's where she felt the most energy. Well, there you go. There was no rhyme or reason to her energy feeling right. whatsoever. And right. I, we were able to demonstrate that. Or do you think she changed her mind? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. No. No, I wouldn't think so. The crystals just don't like being tested. Yeah, well, that's it. They get shy. It's like, it's like God. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Well, he's just not going to reveal, you know... Pearls before swine. There you go. You know, First Samuel fifteen three instead. I think if someone <laughs> asks you why you believe, you should give reasons for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. Yeah, yeah. Pearls before swine. Hundred <laughs> percent. People have a lot of research to do to get half these jokes. I know it's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, lots we, of little eggs. In I've been ending this this season, you know, this year of, of the podcast with uh, you know what's the deal with Mormons? But instead of doing that here, unless there's something pressing that you wanted to ask about. I there is something refer. I'm concerned about. Oh, good. I you telling me that. I don't think I answered you, and I apologize. Did you have yeah, no, you're good. No, I was just going to plug your podcast oh. and my episode of it, because oh. that's where we really dive deep into kind of what I think on the theology and religion. Yeah. Uh, but if there's something else, they I would should, love to get They should definitely go listen to that. It's one yeah. of my favorite. As a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, someone texted me. Oh, my new neighbor. Oh, My new sure. neighbor said, so you do a podcast I hear. I was like, yeah. She's like, send me a link. Yeah. And the most recent one I had done was like with... Uh, like a Bible scholar that was very deep in the woods, and I was yeah. like, "She's gonna." This, I was like, "That's not very <laughs> entertaining." Yeah, I was like, "Check yeah. out this one," and I sent the link to yours. Oh, nice. I'm like, first of all, you're fun. You're yeah. a great guy. We had good chemistry. You're friends with Virgilio already. Right. So there was a great chemistry. Also, most Christians don't mind bagging on Mormons. Yeah. So sure. if I'm arguing sure. with a Mormon about something, like, yeah, those guys are crazy. <laughs> Yeah, Nothing right? like my virgin birth and ascension <laughs> to heaven. Like, totally I different. Right? I love it. I love it but so much. I would say for what's the deal with was Mormonism or Mormons? Mormons. Oh, I say what's <coughs> the deal with Mormons. But Okay, so my the thing that perplexes me the most is that the Mormon church itself uh-huh. has the most evidence of its own beliefs being wrong. Oh, okay. Like... You're it's talking own, about like the documentary, it, like the Netflix no, documentary. No, no, no. I might watch that. Yeah, but yeah. No, yeah. they. I mean, like, I think it was an 1842 writing that Joseph Smith goes in and writes, and and I'm sure you've heard about the Nephi versus Moroni issue. Uh, I haven't. No, no, I haven't actually. So when Joseph Smith, oh, so when Joseph Smith originally wrote, I'm just trying to destroy the entire studio. Right. Oh, yeah, Seth, you I'm got sorry. real excited. Um, I go. This, this yeah, is the yeah. stuff I live for. So, when Joseph Smith originally wrote the story about being approached by the angel Moroni, yeah, he originally wrote that the name of the angel was Nephi, uh huh, and then literally scratched it out yeah. and wrote Moroni above it, yeah, as if one was writing fiction, uh huh, okay, and 
it was published, and I think it was in 1842. Mormonthink.com actually keeps a record of it. Sure. And you can see it. You can see pictures of it. There yeah. are images available of him scratching out the word Nephi and writing Moroni. And yeah. it's that on top of so many other things that the, the Mormon church keeps it. Because, ironically, they value history. Yeah. Yeah, we value history, Almost knowledge, over openness over their own belief. If something yeah. if something comes from history that says maybe this was not true, they're like, "This is history," <laughs> and they put it in the mu- in the museum in the library right. At, right. at the LD, LDS church, and it's like they're so excited to hold on to it, and then the skeptics are going, "You have the evidence," right? And people just go, "Isn't yeah, you it misunderstood great?" It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just that that's what blows me away is that. Right. I wish they would do tours of it. I wish they would do like explanations of it. Uh huh. And it's almost like to me the entire that entire thing is like the woman on the vaccines going, I know that they're helpful and I know right. that they save millions right. of lives. I just don't no, want No thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that's what it feels like to me. So that's interesting. To me it's much more yeah, I think you could become an atheist tomorrow. Yeah. Not believe any of that stuff and still call yourself Mormon for the rest of your life. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's so see, much more I, of a cultural thing. I think. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I have an issue with people who don't go to church and still call themselves Mormon. I know lots of them. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know they're out there. It's the and, same with atheists who are Jewish. Uh huh. They'll say the same thing. It feels more like, almost like, an ethnicity. It's yeah. so much a part of my community and my family. Right. I'll always be Mormon. Well, I had an atheist friend tell me that the other day. I'll always be Mormon even though I don't believe any of it. Yeah, see, and for me, I guess it's me being on the inside of it. It's hard to, like, examine your own culture when you're in it. Yeah. At least it is for me. So they, they say that even though they stopped believing, that yeah. not calling themselves Mormon any longer feels like they're leaving their family. And uh-huh. they would rather leave their faith than their family. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I would think, you know, it's Mormon if you're doing family home evening once a week and if you're going to church like that's that's Mormon culture but if you're not doing that then how you know if you have lots know, of kids like and you have special food outside of Jell-O and I hate Jell-O so that's true maybe I'm not Mormon special, I'm okay. just a believer in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints not a real Mormon you yeah. hate Jell-O yeah wow but I don't know if I have a good answer to, for you on the on the Nephi Marone I think uh, I'll have to look into that because I haven't. Oh, I mean, okay. my my gut reaction is like, hey, you know, he he made a mistake. I have it on my phone. I'll I'll show you when we when we wrap up. Yeah, it's yeah, an yeah. actual on MormonThink.com, and it and it even shows that there has been debate within the LDS leadership on in the past on what to call the angel that originally oh sh- visited him visit him to in even tell him. Yeah, because the, yeah. the original story has his handwriting with the angel Nephi. Interesting. It's it's, it's interesting, Yeah, for sure. I mean, he might have been so distracted by the fact that Moroni was naked that he missed the name. Did you know that? No. Oh, yeah. There's a portion where he's telling this, this event of Moroni coming to visit him that Moroni has just a robe on and nothing else. So. That's bizarre. I mean, I might forget a name, too. <laughs> That's really bizarre. Right? Why would an angel Why would you show make that up in up? the nude? Why would you make that up? Well, and it wasn't totally in the nude. Just like what if Joseph Smith was on like, drugs? Uh, Have we ever thought Hefner. about that? Have we ever thought about him being on acid? I've thought about that. Like, but maybe he was chewing mushrooms I, or something. I don't right? know. I don't. I don't think he was. Kind of a I'm, lame. Kind of a lame trip to really dedicate yourself to. And then <laughs> there's a naked <laughs> angel. That's the best right? you come up. And with. it ends with you getting shot four hundred <laughs> times in a prison. God. It sounds like a. Yeah, I mean, I at least know. he's dedicated. If that's if that's a bad trip, I guess that's part. That'd of be the th- best bad trip movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> starts starts a religion and gets martyred for it. That's the way the movie ends. Bad trip. The entire bad trip. trip three. That's part of the other issue that I'll yeah. that I'll close with. with yeah. this is that um, the th- never knowing when Joseph Smith was speaking as a prophet versus when he right. was. Just like right. the, the, I can understand just that like the polygamy stuff we talked about on yeah, the, yeah, on the yeah. show, like <clears throat> it straight up says that his wife has to partake or she'll be destroyed by God. And Mormons will say As all day, Mormons, <laughs> Mormons will say all day, no, 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 she just had the option to, she wasn't forced. It literally sure. says she's forced. So it's like, well, and then and then when you show them, no, it says God was forced. They go, well, he was speaking for himself. No, it says, I am the Lord your God, and I command. Well, Joseph always Smith, a wiggly way out. If he was wrong, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Ironically, yeah. you mentioned Jello. I say that 
talking with very religious folks a lot of times is like trying to stab Jello. Sure. It just jiggles its way around you. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't matter. Reality yeah. just doesn't matter to me. It's <laughs> well, just, you know. It's it's a better view of reality. Better. It's the fourth dimension that you're unwilling to see. Maybe you're on acid. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Mormonism explained, folks. I love it. Uh, <laughs> David, it is always so good to talk to you, man. Anything you want to plug? Anything I, you coming know, up? I'm David C. Smalley on everything. My TikTok... It has been it's rising recently. Up. It's like 71,000 wow. followers on TikTok. Are you sewing some skin or doing um, dances? What are you doing on I'm, TikTok? I'm doing a little bit of everything. I started yeah. off beating on tables. Oh, okay. That was doing my the jam. Drummer thing. Yeah, nice. doing the drummer thing. Yeah. Shifted to um, messing with my daughter. Okay. And she messes with me. Yeah. Uh, smacks me, throws stuff at me. <laughs> okay. And so we have a war going on right now. Yeah. Uh, scaring her a little bit. Beautiful. Doing some duets. Oh, that's great. Um... It's fun. Yeah. I try to work in a sponsorship now and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a couple of sponsor deals on TikTok. So. Nice. Yeah, so I'm, I'm David C. Smalley on everything. It's in Instagram, Twitter, you name it. Beautiful. David C. Smalley. All right. Well, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Love it. All right, everybody. Have a good week, and we'll catch you again next time. <laughs>